I would like to introduce our very special guest today. Uh, Sheila Prebright is an internationally acclaimed photographic artist known for her photography series, 1960 Now, Plastic Bodies, Young Americans, and Suburbia. Uh, she is described as a soft-spoken woman whose images speak boldly and truthfully, portraying a wide range of knowledge of contemporary culture. The images she presents and captures of culture, and sometimes counterculture, challenges ideas about narratives that are controlled by Western thought and power structures. Her lengthy list of accomplishments include her work being exhibited in a wide array of museum collections across the country, including the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture, and the Library of Congress in Washington, DC. And 1960 Now was also featured in the New York Times prominently. Please welcome Ms. Sheila Prebright. Sheila, thank you so much for being here and taking the time uh, uh, to, to be part of this program. Well, thank you, Laika USA, for the invite and the lecture. And hello, hello, everyone out there. <laughs> uh, Sheila, you have such a wide array of images and, and styles of photography uh, to share. And we've got um, some nice snippets of your work uh, to showcase today, which I'm very excited about. Um, so there's, there's plenty of images to show and, 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 some, and some great stories to tell. Um, so I'd like to, if, if it's okay, if we could just dive right into uh, some of your earlier images um, and you can tell us a little bit about uh, this work and what went into photographing it and, and what it is about it that uh, really motivates you to, to do this kind, of, uh, this kind of art. Okay. So I want to start, you have a, we have a couple of images from your, uh, your hip hop images. Um, can you tell us a little bit about when this was shot and how you got into shooting hip hop? Actually, um, my last year in college, when I graduated, I moved to Houston, Texas, and that was in the early 90s, mid 90s. And being a daughter of a soldier, I've always had curiosity because we actually lived on an army base and we grew up around diversity. And I, as a woman and an African-American, I didn't grow up around a lot of blacks. And so I decided I wanted to know more about the hip hop culture. And in that period, it was gangster rap and hip hop for me, or what the historians are saying is it came out of the civil rights movement because gangster rap and, and hip-hop, they were talking about what was going on in the Black community. Mm -hmm. So I took portraits for um, Rap-A-Lot Records and independent record companies. And that's how I actually got into photographing the hip-hop culture. Gotcha. Um, it's, you know, you... you got into this part of the culture and, you know, I think a lot of people when they might see, you know, these images or if they're not familiar with, with hip hop and rap music, um, it can seem a little bit intimidating. How, how did you feel uh, taking an image like this, for example, um, and, you know, getting into this uh, from, from your own world being a bit of an outsider? Well, actually having a, a strong father figure in the, in the house, um, very strict. He really taught, I had two other sisters. My father was very, very strict and he taught us how to be as women and to deal with the male. male. Mm -hmm. And for me, he taught me to have no fear. So when I went into the communities like in third war and fifth war, it was, I was naive number one though, but I didn't have any fear. And this image that you see right here is Class C. He wanted me, to, he's an independent record company. He wanted me to photograph his CD cover and his promotional photo. And back then, this is just film, it's not digital. So you can't see the images. And this is actually the last um, frame on, in the camera. And I didn't know what to do. And I asked him, I said, why don't you point that gun at me. He said, you want me to point the gun at you? And I said, yes. And he took that gun and he pointed it at me. And that was what I captured with that image. And this is how I actually entered into the art world with this body of work, because me being a woman and soft-spoken, nobody thought I would have images like this. They thought, oh, you have these cutesy like 
fashion images. And this image right here is Scarface. And he used to be part, well, he was part of the Ghetto Boys, but he broke off from them. And Scarface actually was running for city council last year. He didn't make it at all. Oh. But that's how I got into the culture. Yeah. That's uh that's that's really fascinating and it's a uh, it's interesting <laughs> that you 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 requested that pose. I, I you know I think uh many people wouldn't wouldn't have the bravery. Uh, well, when I had my like first that. exhibit with this work, a curator, a friend of mine, which is an artist, he's the one that actually got me my first show in Houston, Texas, and he says uh, this curator needs to come over to look at your work. And when he saw that, he couldn't believe that I shot those images. So my first show, I didn't go to. And the curator called me. He says, you got to get down here, Sheila. I said, no, I don't. I said, and a photograph, a picture speaks for itself. So I said, OK, I'll come down. I came, and I was so nervous because as I entered the door, people were at the door, and they wanted to know about that image of Class C with the, with the gun. They asked me, did he have a bullet in it? bullet in the gun and i said i didn't ask i just took the shot wow uh mm -hmm. and and how like how was it like you know photographing these kinds of, of more like straight up portraits um you know was was it hard to get them to to want to be photographed did you have to kind of uh they have to warm up to it or was it the kind of more when you point the camera they just they wanted to be documented and wanted to, to see their images on on film it wasn't hard at all because when you look at the black male image as far as in hip-hop culture you know society deemed them as criminal and thugs but they're like babies to be honest with you <laughs> i have a, a body of work called gold rush with black males with gold teeth mm -hmm. gold teeth and i started that series and i used to go downtown and it would be a long line of um, um, black males getting gold in their mouth. And I would ask them about, why are you getting gold in your mouth? That's that naiveness that I, 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 I think I have. And they look at me and they're bashful. And they would say, well, my um, brother came home and it looked kind of cool. The girls like it. So <laughs> they're not as hard as the projection as you may think they are at all. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Yeah, they can be yes. they can be softies for sure. Uh, right. And and, and, uh, <laughs> and I would say I just encourage everyone that's here definitely you want to bookmark and check out Sheila's website because we're only going to be showing a, a few samples of of her bodies of work, but she has more that you can check out on her website and she's got a bit of writing about each one. So definitely check that out after the webinar. Um, you know, Sheila, um, you, you we've also we've seen a little bit of how you've documented uh, you know the black community through hip hop and which is very male dominated. Now we have right. another body of work from you uh, that you call plastic bodies. Um, and what can you tell us a bit about how you then with these images showcase uh, female uh, African American community? Well, as a woman and actually being in grad school, because my background is, um, it's not photography. I didn't come through art school. I learned photography on the ground, actually, starting with hip hop culture. And when I came to Atlanta, Georgia, my father, again, he saw the work that I was doing and he was saying that you need to go to school. So he put me through getting my MFA in photography. And it helped me to understand how to conceptualize my work, number one. And number two, I, as an African-American, did not know the how Black bodies were looked upon as far as stereotypes. For example, the gun culture and with the guns, it's like, oh, that's cool. But I think a lot of times, I could say, I could say for me, I didn't know about the stereotypes and how someone looked at, other people looked at that. Like for example, Elvis, he'll have a gun, but that's cool. But a black man with a gun, no. So with this body of work called Plastic Bodies, I didn't realize that black women got their negative stereotype from their body, their body image. Uh, you see this image right here, which is, I think is, is a beautiful image. And I shot this with a, like a SL and she has more buttocks, more breasts. 
And I was thinking about how women, black women especially, view their bodies. Because I have a, a, a friend when I was in school, in grad school, when she came to me, she said, Sheila, I saw B&T for the first time. And I thought that was some porn. I was like, oh, wow. So it's got to, it, it, it started me thinking about how others view black bodies. So I start looking at the Barbie doll and how that Western iconic image of what they call the standard beauty, the standard beauty for Western culture um, um, does not fit all women, especially women. And I'm saying it's all women, but I was really de dealing with women of color. So what I did was I actually started photographing Barbie dolls and, and women and start digitally manipulate them through um, Photoshop to show a sense of reality versus non-reality of how we are we have become plastic and the Barbie doll has become human. Mm -hmm. And with that image, we go back to the one with the, um, the back of it, with the Barbie doll, with the dreads. And at that time when this work came out in 2003, you didn't see even a Barbie doll with dreads on. And then I, you can't see this in a photograph, but you have a copyright of 19, I can't remember, I think it's 1990 something, Mattel. I think, it's, I think it's 99, yeah. Yeah, 1999 Mattel, and it's kind of like a branding for that. So mm -hmm. I wanted to just show the, the sense of law, how women of color lose their identity based and rooted in Western culture through the Barbie doll. Right. Uh, and, and how, so how did uh, this one with the, with the dreadlocks and then the, the, the composite image, how did these come together? Actually, um, I would, um, I would, get a, what is it, um, close-up lens. And I would photograph um, the Barbie and I use one, one light on that. And then I would bring the um, women into the studio and, and replicate that same lighting. And then I would, there, it's like digital compositing of how back in the day, um, Hannah Hock, an artist, where you cut out the newspapers and collage, it's the same mm -hmm. thing that you're doing in Adobe Photoshop now. Right, but it's right. more refi it's more refined. Gotcha. Uh, and and actually, we've got um, we've got a question uh, that I want to ask you. Uh, what what uh, what maybe surprised you, or what did you learn from from this project? And did you, did the people you photographed for the composites did they have a certain reaction to it? Actually, they did because this image that you have up right now, um, she is biracial and she was talking about how she never did fit in on the black end or on the white end. And so that's why if you see one, the face that's kind of crooked up a little bit, it shows the of how she felt about her body, okay, because she didn't fit neither one of those, especially not what she fit, she fit more of the Western culture idea of what you call the ideal standard of beauty though. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting and a, a bit, um, a bit heartfelt. I'm not going to lie. I think it's a bit, it's a bit sad to hear like how, you know, yeah. someone can be, um, feel like they now fit in and then we see it in this, uh, this composition. It's kind of, it's, it's, it's beautifully, but also uh, beautiful, but also a bit tragic at the same time when, you know, someone's, uh, someone's feelings of, that, that mixed of, uh, you know, not fitting in comes right. forward in a, in a Barbie doll. It's, 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 uh, it's quite poetic. So it's a, it's a really impressive uh, body of work. And I know these are just a few images from it. Uh, right. So I encourage folks to check out your website to see more of them. Now we've seen a bit of um, the, the male uh, African-American community. We've seen a bit of female African community in your work, and we've got a bit of, um, you know, how they're represented. Um, now you have another body of work, that's going to be an ongoing trend. You have another body of work. You have another body of work because <laughs> yeah. your work is so uh, When I was expansive. in school, my teacher's like, you're, you're, you're constantly, your mind is constantly going. It's like a lot of artists, they don't know, they say, we don't know when to stop. I, it's just something in me. I know when to stop and I have to move on to the next. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, okay. So if we look at your next body of work, which is suburbia, um, now you you take your commentary and your exploration 
of African American communities into their homes. Um, and you've documented these very intimate spaces um, in a pretty unique way. So can you tell me a little <laughs> bit about, about suburbia? Actually, that started back in 2006. I myself was tired of looking at projected images of the media of Black folks. There's a big diversity of African American culture, and we always see one side of it, and it's very always negative. We see more negative than positive. So I felt that I needed to turn my camera to African American communities that lived in suburbia because in Atlanta, Georgia, you got large com African American communities in suburbia. And at that time, in the art world, in the art world, they were really talking a lot about suburbia. And I was like, wow, I need to talk about the invisibility of African Americans in suburbia. And that's why in these example you see um a picture on the um, on the on the i can't even think right now Armoire but you see yeah. yeah three different generations because in the middle part there is a young girl and then you have the dolls there too so i wanted to show the typical you know ordinary life of african americans and how they live not to call it black suburbia it was just suburbia and i got a lot of slack from that because i my i i became national on this actually body of work um called the santa fe prize photography and when i went there i still had to have curators publishers editors and book publishers to look at the work and they all asked me, were they black homes, number one. And I was told by a publisher that I didn't have enough signifiers in the work to show that these were black homes at all. Wow. Wow. So they, so they were, they were, would you say that they were doubting you or were they just perplexed? I think they were perplexed. They were like, this just looked like my home. You, you just don't have enough, you know, because we're used to that projected image of negative stereotypes when it comes to um, the culture. And so when they see something like that, is this really? It was like the photo editor at the New Yorker. She kept looking at these black homes. <laughs> these black homes were like, yes. That's why I didn't put the black bodies in there. I wanted people to really experience of how one lives. And then I was told that we didn't, we never heard of your suburbia. Why didn't you call it black suburbia? Right. And, so, and that was the whole purpose of the work. I, I'm always trying to show the universal commonality amongst all people with my body, believe it or not, with all of my work. But the subject matter is they, they're black. They're black, but I'm trying to show universal commonality. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, you, you go into these homes and, you know, th these are, are these not people that you know personally? No, actually, no. I started with a, a person that I met, and a lot of African Americans are really kind of cautious about that because of um, how we've been torn down in the media. They don't know me. So a friend of mine, actually, she allowed me to start in her home. And then from one home, it was like word of mouth. And that's how I was able to come into the homes. Right. That's... Uh... Yeah, and and what other what other challenges? Um, it, so you started there. You we kind of worked your way. Um, did you encounter people that just didn't want that you offered, but didn't want that you to come into their home? Correct. Right. Yes. Yeah. Some people. Yes. Yeah, some people actually said no, but when I won the award and they saw it, they were like, "Oh, you come to my home," you know. <laughs> so everybody wanted me to um, um, photograph their home. Yeah. But at first, it is it's it's really a, a challenge. I think as a photographer you have to really connect with people before you even go into their homes and start photographing or, shoot, or shooting. I think that's very important. But since we live in post Corbett now, it's a whole totally different thing. Right. Yeah. Well, work like this now is, I would imagine it's kind of on pause um, for, for a little while, but 
Um, it's actually, it's so funny you mentioned that though. It's, it's a theme we have seen a, a kind of a reference back to another webinar we had with Anne-Marie Vivienne. She talked about when you photograph someone, sometimes it's great to just start without the camera, just start talking to them, have that conversation. And it sounds like you have a similar approach here, uh, right. which makes a lot of sense because you're asking to be in someone's most intimate space, their own homes. Right. Uh, so uh, now we have another, uh, we have more projects up to show of yours. I'd like to actually use this moment to take a few questions for you because uh, okay. we've already got people uh, submitting in the Q&A and I encourage everyone to continue. Uh, we see your questions. Uh, my colleagues in the background are, are working through them uh, to feed those questions to me. So please submit your questions in the Q&A and we'll continue to, uh, to submit more or to ask more for, uh, for Sheila. Um, We've got, uh, so we, we've looked at your different, uh, a few different projects and we have a few more coming up. Someone asks, mm -hmm. uh, what tells you to stop? How do you know when a project is finished? I just kind of know. I just, I just, I, I, I can't even explain it. It's just that I know. A lot of people have asked me to come back and photograph suburbia and I'm like, well, how am I going to photograph it? Because the way that I photographed it, I didn't want to show um, bodies. I wanted to show the experience of someone's home. And if you did see anybody, just like the image that's up right now, you see a woman laying in bed and she's reading Business Week, you know, the future of technology. <laughs> so I just know. I just know with all of my works, because you, you, you've seen like three bodies, hip hop. Um, what was it? Plastic bodies and now suburbia. suburbia. Yeah. yeah, and suburbia is something that I just know. And I tried to go back and photograph in the suburbia. Mm -mm. I just know. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like you're, you've said what you had to say? Yes. Images are made. Yeah. yeah, and move on. Because I know some artists, they could stay two, three, four, five, six years on one body of work. And could you, could you speak a little bit about, there's another question that we have. So uh, can you talk a bit about your process to find these ideas and these concepts and then how you get started on them? Actually, it's the culture, pop culture, popular culture. I'm looking at culture and looking at, at people. I'm really an observer of people. And so what's ever going on in the time that's what draws my attention and really to seek it out. Because a lot of um, stuff that I've done, it led me to the body of work, like plastic bodies. It led me to, I was actually photographing women from 18 to eight, 80 years old, asking them and taking portraits of them, asking them how they felt about their sexuality. Mm -hmm. And from there, I end up, photographing the Barbie doll. That was kind of the ultimate with that. So I go, I go through a process like that, you know, cause like with Serbia, suburbia, I was actually in urban neighborhoods and I'm tired. I was sick of seeing those type of imagery and projecting okay. that. Interesting. So yeah, that's, that's a really interesting approach. Um, do you, do you take inspiration from others? There's another question we have uh, from, from a, a, a viewer. So again, thank you everyone for submitting questions. Uh, do you take inspiration from other photographers? Can you say who, who influences your work? Well, as you, a lot of time with the Barbie dolls, Hannah Hawk, um, the artist and kind of helped me was what, what, what was that movement that they had? Hannah Hawk. And she collaged everything. I can't think of it. I, I can't think no of the movement. Yeah, the movement. So I go back and do research in that way if I'm really looking to see what uh, other artists have done other work and stuff. And like I said, with the body work of suburbia, at that time in contemporary culture, everybody was talking about suburbia. Mm -hmm. Got it. Um, so uh, we've seen a bit of uh, the hip hop and we've seen a bit of plastic bodies and suburbia. Um, the next one, which I would say might be maybe one of your, your most notable uh, uh, works. And it's one that, you know, I would encourage everyone here to check out the book on Amazon uh, for 1960 now. Uh, this brings us over to an, uh, a, quite an expansive body of work. And what can you tell us about 1960 now, when these images were made, the, the, the naming of, of, this, uh, of this body of work, 
and how that how that all came together. Um, first of all, since we're on this right now, um, I would like to honor and 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 thank the families of falling victims of police reality. Well, I can't even say that word right now. I want to speak about. I mean. I want to say their names, Brianna Taylor, Aubrey Ahmad, and George, and George Floyd. And how this body of work came on is I was really Trayvon Martin. And when that happened with Trayvon Martin, I started thinking about young people and how young people are the ones that are going to not going, it's always making the change. They're the ones that's going to start the revolution to make change. And I reached back and started trying to get in contact with the elders that were in the movement, the civil rights movement. And I was particularly interested in the ones that were unknown because I felt that those were stories that we did not know about because we have the books and we have these other leaders, but we don't know who the other ones are. So I started in my studio the, uh, when Trayvon Martin happened and started photographing the elders. And from there, when the uprising started, I felt as an artist that I needed to go to the ground myself to see what was going on because too far along um, within our culture, our story's been told by the white male narrative. And that's how we learn about ourselves through the white male narrative. So this is how this body of work started. So I'm taking it generational because I took portraits. I don't have them here um, in, in, in the program, but I photographed the elders that were in the movement in the 60s and I photographed the young people portraits too, along with the protest images because I felt that that was very important because I myself, my parents did not teach me about the civil rights movement. And when I started talking to Mr. Lonnie King, who started the Atlanta student movement here um, in Atlanta, Georgia, I ran home to my mom like a little kid. I said, mom, why didn't you tell us about the civil rights movement? She said, and I'll be quite frank with everyone. She said, because I didn't want you to hate white folks. So I, this was like a big journey for me to learn more about the civil rights movement from the elders and then speaking with the young people because they feel that they're fighting this, they say they're fighting the same fight as their grandparents and parents. And so when I go to the ground, I was actually shooting with the Olympus camera and I always shoot low and I'm not I'm not clicking on the shutter. I'm looking for moments. For example, this image right here of this young man crying. That is so moving to me because you don't see those type of images in the media. What are we seeing not now? A lot of black males on top of cars and the burning. Those are the stereotypes that's constantly ingrained in everyone's mind. Mm -hmm. I want to do something different today. I went to a press conference with the mothers and and women of Georgia State legislatures, young women, and they were telling their stories. It was so emotional. It was so emotional. Those are the stories that I would like to, to speak upon because these are, it's different layers to all of this. And I choose to photograph in black and white, and that's how I came up with the name 1960 Now, What Has Changed? I feel now the world is changing, spiritually so, but we as humans are not changing at all. And this is another mother who lost her child here in Atlanta, Georgia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I think it's... Uh... I have to say, you know, you're, the way you photograph and and document uh, these have documented these protests and and uh, the, the body of work in in 1960 now, um, it's very poignant. I think it, it it's it becomes apparent to me how your previous work informs what you do now, and then you know obviously you you approach it with a, a high level of respect, um, you know, especially I think to to document the mothers um, is something that 
you know, I don't know many people that could look at these kinds of images and not feel some kind of tug <laughs> on their heartstrings. Um, actually brings me to, uh, if we could, I'm going to go ahead and jump a little bit ahead. We, you, I know uh, Sheila wanted to talk a little bit about another project you did, which is adjacent to this and, and relevant to the mothers um, of a, a work you did with mothers uh, of uh, people who have been, uh, you know, victims of, of this violence and how you looked back to the past again an ongoing theme is that you look back to the past and take inspiration whether it's civil rights history or uh in the photography world so i'm going to jump to this image here uh which is from richard avedon um and can you tell me about what you saw in this image and then what we're going to see next in yours actually i've been photographing the protest since Trayvon since for five years now, book out, travel, talk. And at the end of 2016, right before the next president came about, and Colin Kaepernick took a knee, and you guys already know about all of that. Mm -hmm. the, in, um, an organization here in Atlanta commissioned out 10 artists to do murals and it had to do with the legacy of civil rights then and now but they did not tell me that it was part of the nfl <laughs> and i was mad because i'm with <laughs> colin kaepernick okay mm -hmm. and i um everybody saw me on tv and they said sheila you got to do this and i'm like no i'm not going to do it so me sheila said okay if I'm gonna do it, I'm, I'm gonna do something that I feel that was very important that I can draw a lot of people into. And I did not know what I wanted to do, but I started thinking about the mothers because that is the, the source and the glue that keeps us together. And I'm not just saying African-American humanity is the mother and the woman, okay? Mm -hmm. And so I was on, researching on Google. And matter of fact, Richard Avedon, when I was in school, I was really drawn to his work because of his portraiture. And I'm really an, a big observer of people. And when I saw this image with him holding his nine month old child, Phyllis Bond, and behind him is the SNCC students, students of nonviolent coordinating committee, and they were fighting for voter, voter rights and inequality. I said, I need to recreate that image um, with the mothers. And this was taken in, Richard Avedon came to Atlanta in 1963, and I really didn't know this about him. He actually, is my phone crooked or my crooked? A little bit, that's okay. <laughs> okay, because uh, I see it going down and I don't, I don't know why. But he came to Atlanta in 1963 to photograph the movement and take portraits of these civil rights leaders. This is Julian Bond, um, that is the president in Atlanta at the time with, with the organization. And when he went back up north, he was really distraught. And I did not know this about him. He stopped doing photography for two years because his colleagues and peers did not like him doing this at all. So, and this was taken in Vine City, and did I say 1963? And so what I decided to do, I invited Eric Garner's mother, I Can't Breathe, Samira Rice, uh, Tamir Rice's mother, the little boy that got shot in Cleveland with the gun, and Oscar Grant in Oakland, and that was, uh, I think, in 2009, and the rest of the mothers here in Atlanta. So mm -hmm. I recreated that image in Vine City with the mothers, and, and this is Miss Gwendolyn Carr, Eric Garner's mother in the middle with the white on, with her hands out. And these are the rest of the mothers. And I actually put Dr. Rosalind Pope that's next to Miss Gwendolyn Carr on the white, on, on the white. I think she's to the, yeah, the old, she's the oldest. She authored the Pill for Human Rights. Um, at Spelman College, she was like 20 years old. She was a, in the civil rights and the Atlanta student movement. Oh, wow. And Miss Carr, that was one of my last photographs. I didn't tell her to bring her hands out like that. And this, to me, it speaks volumes because if you look at Richard Avedon's image, he's with Chow. They are without Chow. 
and her hands are open and they and some of my friends have um, flowers and they threw the rose petals coming out. That's like their children had fallen. Mm. And so I was talking about the then and the now and how these mothers are marching on because they never knew that they were going to be in a position that they were going to be after this. And for them to relive George Floyd's experience, I've called a lot of them. It's, it's constant trauma and trauma and trauma, but they continue to march on. And these are murals on the wall in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and you could see that they're about 30 feet high and you have the Richard, Don, Richard Avedon image and then you have the mother's image and they were taken in Vine City too in 2018. Wow, uh, this is, there is so much and I see a lot of people in the chat uh, uh, saying so powerful, amazing work, uh, I, I just absolutely beautiful. So thank you everyone for your, your comments. Um, and, you know, I think that it, it's it's it honestly it really does tug a bit of my heartstrings just to hear you say uh you know there he was with child and, and then in your photo they are without um it's it's very powerful it's very moving um it's one of those things that i think anyone can connect with because we all have a mother we all you know and right. uh, it's 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 a universal truth um you know so uh it's it's really a beautiful image and i love that you can see this uh these murals beside each other and is this still up in Atlanta? Oh, yes, it is. It actually, the Richard Avedon Foundation told me I only had a year, but James, he's a sweetheart. He said, you keep it, keep it up as long as it look good. <laughs> <laughs> so it's still, it is very, it's very relevant right now because of mm -hmm. what's going on. It's yeah. very, very, yes. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's incredibly, incredibly powerful. And I, I really appreciate that you, know, you, you shared this with us. Um, and it really, I think it does a great job also of summarizing a bit of your work and, and, and how, again, you look to the past, uh, to what's going on now and to, you know, where the future is. Um, now to just change gears a little bit and also show okay. how, how, uh, how varied your, your portfolio is, how varied your, your bodies of work are. Uh, we have another body of work. I told you we were going with that trend. Uh, <laughs> we want to show so much, uh, cause okay. there's so much great stuff. Um, you have another one called Invisible Empire, um, and this is also uh, looking to history uh, and telling a story that, you know, is one of those things where I'm sure uh, is, is fairly unknown. Uh, so what can you tell us about Invisible Empire and this, this, this series of landscapes we're about to see? What are we seeing here? Well, me as an artist, um, I'm constantly challenging myself because I feel that I am putting the work out, but am I really helping with anything? And at the end of 2019, I received a call from the photo editor from the Washington Post, didn't know who he was, Dudley. And he says, this is Dudley from the Washington Post and we wanna commission you out to do a photo essay. And I said, well, what is it about? He said, racism, I started laughing. And he said, everybody that I talked to laughed. I said, because we're so tired. Are we, are we helping? Are we doing anything? And I told him this, I would do this, but I am not going to photograph people because we get so caught up on these physical bodies, we can't get past anything. And I wanted to talk about the root of racism, OK? And I don't know if anybody know about W.E. Du Bois, a scholar, a professor um, at the Atlanta universities back in the day. He, I found a quote from him about Georgia. He said, Georgia is beautiful, I'm paraphrasing, Georgia is beautiful, but very disturbing. And he called it the invisible empire. And I live in suburbia, 10 minutes away from this mountain. And this is Stone Mountain Park, where the um, Daughters of the Confederacy back in the um, 18, 1900s, they wanted to create memorial for, you guys know, the civil rights. And this is a big carving. It's a beautiful, beautiful park, but it's rooted in racism. And I really wanted to show how beautiful it was 
the um, darkness it, it, it had, but it was beautiful and how it was the second coming of the KKK. Because on Thanksgiving Day in 19, I might have this wrong, it's either 1921, they went to, up to Stone Mountain, this part, and they burnt a cross and they actually read Romans um, um, chapter 12. And that's when that was the rebirth of the KKK. And by the end of 1926, it was 30 million members of KKK. And they were not just in the South, they were in the North too, actually. And yeah, so a, I'm showing you the landscape as I walk through this part because you can meditate. But me, I think about my parents who grew up during the Jim Crow era. They are from a generation where they were young people growing up there and where they had to d deal with the black signs, the white signs. They had to look down across the street when a white person come. I think about them a lot when I walk through this park. And this is, they, they still have the Confederate flag on the mountain. And they actually allowed the white nationalists to come and do their rallies here in Atlanta, Georgia. Wow. Yeah, there's uh it's, it's amazing to see such a beautiful landscape and, uh, right. and something that, um, you know, to the, to the first glance um, is lovely. Um, but, you know, the, it's, it's history. Um, is well to say it's complicated is, is underselling it it's a uh, it's it's a, a dark history that is uh is very tricky um and, and i know a lot of people have have struggled with how to how to approach that uh when you have beautiful uh engraving but you know in this rock face but what it means um and yeah i love the way you use black and white for for these photographs um you know and that you brought us to this this land that's so close to you um you know physically um, but in some ways it couldn't be further from you, uh, in symbolically, um, you know, in the condition of that, that battle flag. And then we have one more image from this, uh, from this, uh, snippet of the, you know, <laughs> I didn't mean to cut you off, but was no, really no, no. interesting about this image. I, um, when I first came to Atlanta, my husband and I, because my parents, um, are from the South. And when my father retired, he went back to where he was born in a little town in Waycross, Georgia. I never grew up in the South at all. And when I came down here, I said, mom, what is going on? She said, baby, you in the South. And I'm like, okay. So when I went to the Stone Mountain, I didn't realize they had slave homes um, there for people to visit too. And I thought what was so really interesting that they had a cotton ball on the slave quarters here. And I was like, well, back then, do you think they would allow them to have cotton on their, on their table or something? But it was, that's how they coordinated and stuff. It's really very, very, really interesting place, but and very disturbing though. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, it's a, uh, it's a bit pretty crazy to think that, you know, that the, these land, these quarters are still there, but it's a, you know, it's a part of history and it's a, a bad part of our history, but um, you know, it's important to, to, to remember the lessons from it. Um, now we have one more uh, swath of your work and that's some, uh, some portraits and some, uh, some street photography style work that you you've done at times. Um, and right. we have a bit of a dichotomy because we have some pre COVID times and some, some within COVID. Uh, so what can you tell us about your style of shooting on the street and, and capturing, uh, portraits like this one and our next one, uh, while, but while you could still get close to people. Yeah, actually, this is, um, before we knew anything about COVID-19, which was probably already here. Um, I, really, I get a lot of my inspiration, believe it or not, by going into the communities, okay? And like I said before, these are images that I'm not necessarily going to use for a body of work. It just gives me in, um, inspiration. So I go down into the community, get out of the car, and I just start talking to everybody and ask them maybe why they're on the streets, what's going on with them and try to really 
uplift their character. And what I do is these are portraits. I, I love portraits. I love black and white. I've shot the shot this with the um like the SL, and they all really get excited with me because I come back with a print to give them at all. So these are and and and, and as far as the the communication is before COVID-19, I was engaging with them more, but now post COVID is totally different because we're dealing with something that's very invisible. We don't know what it is. And I was in the car with this image. So I don't have that. I feel as an as a artist photographer, I don't have that connection anymore at all and i drove up to this testing site and i start talking to um this young well not young man but this um, um man and he did not want me to photograph him and normally when someone say don't photograph me i don't but i asked him i said this is very very important but he said no but when he looked away i took his photograph and normally i don't do that at all mm -hmm. Yes. But you felt, did you feel you just, you had to adapt to the moment because of this is a, yes. such a different time? Yeah, it's, it's such much a different time because if you, um, and I was really interested in the essential workers and I would go, I don't have, I don't have these images here. I would go into the grocery stores trying to photograph them and it was very hard to do that. And it makes me feel uncomfortable as an artist of not engaging with someone and not asking them, um, can I take your photograph? Now with her, I actually got out of the car and asked her, and she's actually a student at one of the colleges and she's a, actually a essential worker. And she said, yes, you can photograph me. And she was on the phone. And uh, you, you, did you have to physically adapt in terms of like, even like your, your lens selection and, and your choice to-, to Oh yes, because back? I'm, sh yes, I'm shooting with a, um, an actually a 90 millimeter a portrait lens. I really need something longer, but mm -hmm. I'm staying my distance, my distance from that. Yes, yeah. And it's, it doesn't, for me, it doesn't feel good because that's not me and that's not my personality. That's not how I want to connect. But I think in post-COVID now is that we have to rethink about how we're going to do things, especially as photographers, because I have a friend that's a journalist that went to Detroit and he says, Sheila, do not get on that plane. He said he drove his car to Detroit. He rented out an Airbnb. He had all his PPE gear on and he still caught it. Wow. So we're dealing with something that's invisible. And I know there's the controversy of masks and not masks, but you know what? I looked at um, images, and this is even before COVID-19 of China. They've always wear masks, okay? And we are like little in America children I don't want to wear masks. It's my right, my freedom. So I'm really looking at all of that because it's really changing how we think. And I think that if we can, we need to really kind of rewire our minds and being, say, stay home, is really forced me and challenged me to reflect about me and who I am as an artist. And it's challenging me to photograph things that I would never photograph. I'm in a room right now where I have, you see the umbrellas, but then I, it's my workroom too, and the window is to my right, maybe to your left, and I'm taking photographs <laughs> when I see things from outside the window and calling it a view from my window. <laughs> <laughs> and then this image right here, um, I went out when they, um, I didn't go to Brunswick, Georgia. Um, I went out to where they were having a rally at for um, Ahmad, Avery Ahmad, and I took a portrait of, of the image with the mask on, and it has hashtag Avery Ahmad. Yeah. And this is the, this is, this is, I, this is the future. This is the future of how we are gonna live, how we need to rethink and recreate and rewire, rewire our brains. Yeah, yeah, and, and your, I think your work shows us, and especially from, 
1960 now to Invisible Empire to now even some of these COVID street uh, photographs, um, how we have these these cultural moments now happening where we maybe a lot in a lot of ways we need to rewire things, um, you know, personally and and as a country. But you know, it's uh, it's trying times for sure. Um, it's amazing to see how you and other artists uh, adapt to it for sure. Um, now we've got. Uh, some questions for you before we before we wrap up again okay. thank you everyone for for submitting questions uh antonio do you have the picture where i have a, a, at least one shot from the window and they probably can't see it too much it's really <laughs> I, do you I have one of those images don't, i don't think i have it in here i'm sorry oh, okay uh, yeah but it's really but cool I, but but you know what i was saying is i'm photographing mm -hmm. flowers i would never photograph flowers but i'm photographing flowers okay mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, not you know, the typical it, way. <laughs> but there's there's something to be said though about you know you're you're trying even even you know you're not staying passive you're not staying like just you're not uh, like just taking the time off you're you're working within the parameters that you have at home and with whether it's with studio lighting or even yeah just shooting out out, out the window and taking a picture and seeing what you get um, to inform your creative uh, elements and to to further your creativity and yeah. and you know creativity is a muscle and you have to work it. Um, if you just let it sit, you can get some atrophy and then you got to start over again. So between your works that have so much creativity and, uh, again, such a variety of styles, um, it makes perfect sense that you would, you know, just constantly be working, even if it's a, if it's a shot out the window to see what you get. Um, so <laughs> right. with that being said, we've got, uh, some really great, uh, questions, um, that I'd like to ask you. Uh, so you have photographed in moments that are tense, such as with the 1960 Now stuff especially. Um, are you, and there's a question from a viewer, are you ever torn between recording history and creating art? Is that something that you have to, to, to think about or, or do you have to balance that? I don't think about that. I just do the work, okay? It's, it's not, for me, it's not one or another. It's do the work. I never actually saw 1960 Now was going to be part of a body of work or a book or anything like that because a lot of people you know at one time when i came out of um, grad school fine art photographer i'm changing that no i'm not a fine art oh you're a documentary photographer no i'm not so i'm calling myself a photographic artist or so whatever i want to photograph you know it's fine but i don't i don't look at those labels of art or 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 nothing like that. I just do the work, mm -hmm. and then it just comes all together. Gotcha. Uh, and and one thing I will say to that though is that when you're in these historic moments, I think it's also the way you inform yourself with history, both photographic and just a straight up American history, um, that really helps your work really shine. Um, we got another really good question that I'd like to tackle um, uh, from another viewer. Um, do you have any advice for photographers uh, watching on how to avoid crossing into, say, exploitation with their photography? Um, there's a, there are plenty of photographers going out and documenting protests, and they feel like, um, you know, if they show faces, uh, are they exposing someone to unwanted um, hate or, or, or difficulties because uh, they are present at a protest? Um, you know, what, what should, uh, what, what, what can you, advice can you give to a photographer shooting now? Okay. I photographed protests and I did not want to show the imagery of what the media project all the time when it comes to a stereotype. And if you look at my work, it is protest images, but I'm catching moments like before earlier on, I'm talking about you seeing a black male cry. Okay. Um, you seeing the mothers and I look, when I photograph, I look at them as portraits. I don't really look at them as protest images. And a lot of people tell me that the work, they say something about your images look different from everybody else because I want you to feel, I've been on that ground, I've seen the hurt, I've seen the pain, I've seen the fear. And I want you to feel these images. So when I'm out there photographing, I'm feeling, I participate to a point where I start walking with them, maybe chanting, and it's very emotional. And today, 
when the mothers were speaking their narratives about their sons, but not just about um, their sons being shot, but also how they were treated, any human being, it was, it was so emotional. I could not, I had to get myself together for this, you guys, because I got in the car and I was crying. And these, for me as an artist, I think as image makers, I got a call from Bloomberg yesterday and for, they want me to do a shoot. I mean, do some photographing for business week. I'm trying to get to a point. Okay. Business week. And she said, she's a white woman. She says, I am so tired of seeing a black male on top of a car with fire. She said, we are the ones that are perpetuating those negative stereotypes. What I want you to do I want you to go photograph suburbia. I'm going to try to get it in. She said, we as image makers have to change, okay? We have to change that narrative. Don't get me wrong. You're going to have the negative and the positive, but we see more negative than positive. And a lot of people don't want to deal with the positive because there ain't no money in that. Nobody wants to look at it. But when are we as a people going to stand and start changing those narratives and change it that way? from corporations to independent image makers. Right, that's a, that's a very poignant and very well said, uh, I, must, I must say. So thank you for sharing that and for the advice. Um, we, I got one closing question uh, before we fully wrap up. Um, so in these uh, pretty challenging times, is there anything that is causing you to be hopeful um, as a photographer and just in general? Yes. The young people, <laughs> but I honestly think we're going to really have, and COVID-19, COVID-19, if you think about it, I'm, I'm getting ready to go out here, you guys, COVID-19 takes your breath away. I can't breathe. What happened to George Floyd and all these other black bodies? Well, um, Eric Gardner, I can't breathe, okay? And I do believe that Things are going to get worse, but it's going to get better. And we're going to have to be, everybody's not going to make it through this. And we're moving into a new decade. It's hard, but you got to keep on creating and keep on. And I'm, I'm really looking at the young kids, three years old and six, because those are the ones that we're going to have to teach. Because by the time they're six years old, they know who they are. I think that's a, that's a great, a great message for the ending. And, and I, I, I will say also, I'll add to that, that uh, in teaching uh, young people and those, those even three-year-olds and six-year-olds, if we can teach the work that you show, I think that they'll come away uh, for the better. Uh, yeah. So Sheila, thank you. And uh, I want to get everyone just to know that, you know, you can follow Sheila on, uh, on Instagram uh, at sheprebright. Uh, check out her website. As I mentioned, uh, she's got a variety of more bodies of work, and you can also see a little bit of writing about each one. Um, her book, 1960 Now, is available on Amazon. I know my, my colleagues were in the chat uh, posting some helpful links, including that. Uh, so definitely check out the book. Sheila, thank you so much. I, I really cannot thank you enough for your time uh, and, and for sharing these amazing images, this amazing story, uh, these amazing stories, and this amazing advice uh, and bit of hope uh, for the future. Uh, thank you, Sheila. Well, thank like I thank Leica for this, and everybody out there. I don't know if they can hear me. Um, stay creative. If you guys are image makers, push yourself and challenge yourself, and much love. Fantastic, perfectly said. Thank you, everyone, again for your time, and we'll see you again next time. Let's stay home with Leica. <laughs>